<laughs> He's just not that into you. Ugh, Big is such a douchebag. Uh, it's so true though, right? Mm. I mean, that is why Jason was so distant to me after the Pimps and Hoes party. He's just not that into me. I should text him though just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love texting. Mm. Yeah, I have all the numbers memorized so that I don't even have to look at my phone anymore. It's like super convenient when you're driving. <laughs> More schmear enough, please. <laughs> By the way, what did you think of Chicago winning the Oscar the other night? Oh, it's fine. I just, all I could think of was that Moulin Rouge was hella robbed when it lost a couple years ago. Oh yeah? I've never seen it. You've never seen Moulin Rouge? It is only the movie that made me buy my first DVD. Wow, uh, what's it about? It's this new movie musical that has a rockin' anachronistic score, energetic choreography, fast edits, bright colors, a swoon-worthy leading man, and a romance that's doomed for some reason. It's about love, beauty, and being true to yourself all while singing your face off. It's the best movie musical ever! Well, we have to watch it! Yeah! You have to keep looking. <laughs> Robin Thicke is such a douchebag. Oh, I can't get that long out of my head though. Yeah, no, yeah, what? I don't know we don't want it. Okay, okay, enough, enough, enough. <laughs> Alright, let's finish these mimosas and get back to binging some oranges and new black. I love how everyone thinks I look like Taylor Schilling. <laughs> you know, when she's not wearing any makeup and under harsh prison industrial lighting, but still, I mean, spot on. <gasps> oh, BT Dubs. What did you think of Anne Hathaway winning the Oscar for Les Miserables? Oh my god, she so deserved it. She's mm. so amazing. I kind of can't believe how much movie musicals have made a comeback since Chicago. <gasps> Wasn't there a big one before that? <gasps> it, it Moulin Rouge! Oh my god, Emily, we were obsessed with that movie when we were 20. <laughs> oh my god, Moulin Rouge. God, I don't think I've seen that movie in like eight or nine years. Yeah, we were in love with that movie. <laughs> Shman, we have to watch it. It'll be just like when we were 20 years old. Okay, yeah, let's do it. I mean, we're not that old yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Under his eye. Hey Emily, we're about to watch a movie. You want to join us? Sure, what's it about? It's a new movie musical with a rockin' anachronistic score, energetic choreography, fast-paced edits, bright colors, a swoon-worthy leading man, and a romance that's doomed for some reason. It's about love, beauty, and being true to yourself all while singing your face off. It's the best movie musical ever. Greatest thing you'll ever learn. The greatest showman. Come 
I'm getting too old for this. Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. I'm Trip. I'm Daryl. And I'm Emily. And welcome to Stealing Focus. The show where we review movie and TV musicals, comparing them to their source material. And rating them on their own merits. To determine once and for all whether or not they live up to our lofty expectations as true aficionados of the Great White Way. We'll be looking at the moments that are a standing O. Yes! A slow clap. Meh. Or carry the musical. Boo. Today, we're talking about the 2017 original movie musical, The Greatest Showman. Released in December 2017, The Greatest Showman was directed by Michael Gracie in his directorial debut and features a book by Jenny Bix and Bill Condon. The film showcases nine new songs from the team of Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who won multiple Tony Awards for their musical Dear Evan Hansen and an Oscar for Best Original Song for La La Land. Starring Hugh Jackman, The Greatest Showman tells the true-ish story of P.T. Barnum and how his charming flim flamry spawned the creation of the Barnum Circus. Let's get this out of the way right now. This movie plays fast and loose with history. The real P.T. Barnum lived from 1810 to 1891. He was married to the love of his life, Charity, from 1829 until her death in 1873. And a few years before that, in 1871, he founded the Barnum and Bailey Circus. Later in life, he was a politician, yada, 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 yada. The Greatest Showman takes place sometime in the late 19th century in a post-Civil War alternate universe where most racial tensions are gone, but whatever. Young Queen Victoria is around, so... Showman presents Barnum as a lovable con man, a Harold Hill type, someone who will swindle you with a smile. In fact, the film ends with a quote from the man himself. The noblest art is making people happy. Okay, that's a nice quote and all, but P.T. Barnum's most famous catchphrase was, there's a sucker born every minute. And that's not even uttered once in the film. Yeah, it's worth noting that this is not based off of the musical by Cy Coleman known as Barnum, where the first song is indeed titled, There's a Sucker Born Every Minute. Many reviewers were unimpressed with The Greatest Showman's saccharine retelling of the Barnum myth, so it wildly underperformed with critics and during awards season. But that doesn't matter because audiences loved it. It's the fifth highest grossing live action movie musical of all time, and the soundtrack continues to break records around the world, especially in the UK. The Brits and their spectacle musicals, I tells ya. I don't care, cause this movie makes me feel all the feels. I laughed, I cried, I danced, I swooned. What's not to love? Emily, you can't tell me you've never felt this way about a movie musical before. Look, there are plenty of reasons musicals take liberties with actual history, but the question is, does The Greatest Showman stand up on its own? Ugh. Okay, I'm not made out of stone, all right? The soundtrack is fantastic. Yay! <laughs> Seriously, every single one of these songs is a total bop, and I can't get enough of it. Pasek and Paul have clearly inherited Andrew Lloyd Webber's evil powers to write a catchy hook. Pop music is so sad and dreary these days, so if we get our happy, dancey tunes from movie musicals, so be it! My favorite song is Come Alive, especially when the freaks gain their courage and, and dance their hearts out. The choreography by Ashley Wallen is genius, not only because it's thrilling and unique, but it's simple enough to be recreated by devoted audiences upon repeat viewings. Many of the group numbers are filmed like music videos with straight on shots interspersed with quick edits. You can appreciate how much time and effort went into all of it. Ugh, this cast is so good! Hugh Jackman is at his best when he's playing a fun-loving song and dance man, and every part of his performance is a delight. 
Yeah, Jackman has spoken about how he had to undergo extensive vocal training for the role, as he's a legit Broadway baritoner and he's used to singing roles like Curly in Oklahoma. Lots of vibrato! Yep. yep, 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 yep. Poppy in the mask belting was something he had to learn how to do. And the rest of the cast knocks that out of the park too. Rebecca Ferguson and Michelle Williams. How does Rebecca Ferguson make the other woman so sympathetic? Oh, and Michelle, you do so many sad indie films. It's so nice to see you happy and smiling and dancing. Kiel Assel. Madame Tenardier for the win. And of course, Zendaya and Zac Efron. I mean, Troy Bolton has no right being this good. No right! And just look at Zendaya crying over Ephra at the hospital. She's riveting! Plus she did a lot of those aerial acrobatics too, come on! I think Rewrite the Stars is my personal favorite. A passionate duet filled with incredible visuals and sexual chemistry off the charts. I don't know, it kind of feels like Broadway fangirl service to me. Oh, Emily, come on, don't tell me you don't know what it's like to be swept up into a passionate romantic duet. Um, besides Kiala Settle, there are a few other Broadway actor Easter eggs. Like Will Swenson as Barnum's father, and the Judd Fry to Jackman's Curly, Shuler Hensley as the lead protester. With a very convoluted plan, by the way. Did they buy tickets to the show just to start a riot? The film is also beautiful to look at, and takes full advantage of every cinematic possibility. The costumes, cinematography, sound design, editing, CGI. It's so pretty! I'd also like to thank the people involved for making all the animals CGI. They look like cartoons, sure, but I have no desire to revisit the animal cruelty the Barnum and Bailey Circus inflicted for decades. And that's it for good stuff! Wait, Emily, what's your favorite song from the film? Uh, well, I'm partial to the other side, myself, as it is the only song that drives the plot. It's true, it is the only song in the film that drives the plot. If you take it out, it won't make sense. And... It's fangirl service of the best kind, you guys! Oh, those harmonies, those dance moves, those sexy growls, that bartender. Oh, it is Troy Bolton and Wolverine dancing around in top hats and rolled up shirt sleeves! But yes, it drives the plot. Mr. Barnum, I can't just run off and join the circus. Ah, comfort, the enemy of progress. Do you realize that just associating with you could cost me my inheritance? Oh, it could cost you a lot more than that. You'd be risking everything. But on the other hand, you could find yourself a free man. Right here, right now, I put the offer out. What's your name again, brother? Ah, uh, Phineas T. Barnum at your service. The greatest showman this side of the Pacific. Hey, me too! Dude, I've been writing one great song for 20 years now. Uh, men will always suffer more from imagining too little than too much. Huh. Emily, where'd you find this guy? He only talks in inspirational phrases. <laughs> <laughs> I found him at the circus. Okay, can we keep this thing moving? Huh? Let's keep this moving! All right, let's take it from the magic mic part. What? what? Dance, monkeys, dance! Stakes, but it never really wants to go there, if you know what I mean. What do you talk? There's lots of conflict keeping our characters at odds. Are there? They whip up a love triangle between Barnum, Charity, and Jenny Lind, but the closest they get are some lingering looks and gasp, a head on the shoulder. It's set up like Barnum is absolutely falling for Jenny, but in the end, he's barely tempted. I guess the film didn't want any moments where they showed irredeemable flaws in their leading man. 
course, we get the tried and true trope of turning Jenny Lind, a woman who was beyond famous in her own right, into the jilted woman. Never gets old. Curses thwarted by 1870s paparazzi! Now that I think about it, there are lots of female characters, but very few of them interact. I think the only ones who share something resembling a conversation are Charity and her daughters. Well, that makes sense. It's P.T. Barnum's story. Yeah, but sometimes it's Ann Wheeler and Philip Carlyle's story. Keep in mind, this film takes place just after the Civil War, and the worst conflict Anne and Philip get are some impolite stares and concerned hubbub. But maybe it's like how the film approaches the score. It's not supposed to be taken as history, but it's stylized vision of the past. Yeah, but Shonen contradicts this idea by having the star-crossed lovers torn apart by their status. If lines like this are littered throughout the film. You know, people aren't gonna like it if you put us on the stage. <laughs> are we all invited? We're parading around with their help. But no one ever wants to talk about why. It's presented as a minor inconvenience, like the lingering looks an interracial couple might get in the South now. But this is the 1870s! They could be arrested for this! That's real conflict! But the closest the film gets is Schuler Hensley using spooks as a racial slur. The film just skims the surface, making the conflict seem hollow. Well, I guess there are some nitpicks I could point out. Like, how does Barnum receive letters from Charity when he's living on the street? Why is Jenny Lynn touted as an opera singer, but instead she sounds like a cross between Adele and Sia? What is that wrinkle smoothing on 18-year-old Hugh Jackman? Why is Charity's father a cardboard cutout of a character? I know I mentioned how great the score and choreography are, but one number that drives me crazy is A Million Dreams. Oh. God, that song is six minutes long, but it feels like it's 60. Well, but Michelle Williams and Hugh Jackman's pod to do is reminiscent of Fred and Ginger. Yeah, if I could see it, maybe it would be. I don't know if it's because of their body doubles or it's legitimately sped up, but this is Fred and Ginger on meth. Slow down. I want to actually see these dance moves, and how can they sing while running and flipping like that? Jesus, this is overkill. This is like that scene in that weird movie version of Bye Bye Birdie where they give the Russian ballerinas speed to make them dance faster. Yeah, I'm not kidding. The Cold War was weird. <laughs> the book, the book, the book. Or more specifically, the parts of the book that ended up on the cutting room floor. You know, upon repeat viewings of The Greatest Showman, you know, as that musical theater delivery system wears off, so many more plot holes become apparent. Yeah, it might just be me, but it feels like there's 30 minutes missing. Well, and the biggest casualty is the relationship between Philip and Anne. You guys, their relationship is the emotional core of the film. Oh yeah? Look again. First off, Barnum notices Carlyle at an event, and Charity mentions that he's a playwright in a bit of a scandal. What is that scandal? We will never know. But whatever it is, it drives him to drink and be miserable enough to consider joining the circus. Forty minutes into the film, we get Philip and Anne's first interaction. A lingering glance on a trapeze, followed by three lines of dialogue. Then, at Jenny Lynn's concert, they hold hands. But when they stop holding hands, Anne is hurt. Not just by the casual racism, but because we infer there is a previous relationship between them. Later, she dances again angrily at him like, Yeah, take me or leave me. Then Carlisle takes Anne to the theater, they say a couple more lines of dialogue, she's called the help. There's another kinda full scene, they try to rewrite the stars, but she can't handle it because reasons. There's a fire, she's by his side at the hospital, then they say, screw the haters, let's do this thing. There's a theater critic, character, named James Gordon Bennett, who is set up like he's going to be Barnum's stuffy nemesis. But he ends up in the periphery for most of the time. Same with O'Malley, Barnum's first employee, a former thief, who you will think will be Barnum's right-hand man, but he straight up disappears halfway through the movie. Actually, now that I think about it, Charity has a weird line in the third act that completely contradicts everything we've just seen in the film. Why didn't you ask me before? I would have said yes. I never minded the risk, but we always did it together. 
No, you didn't. He bought the museum and the house without your knowledge, then went on tour with Jenny Lynn without consulting you. And we haven't even gotten to the subject of the circus performers. Besides the shameless historical inaccuracies, Barnum was not the same of the freaks, despite what the film would have you believe. There's basically no relationship between them, very few actual conversations or interactions, just dance numbers. So when Barnum snubs them and they all sing, this is me, you wonder why they even care. <gasps> Lord, that lady can sing! <laughs> what are you doing here? You have a show in an hour, okay? That's enough time to get at least three drinks, right? No, 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 bearded lady. <laughs> My name is Letty Barnum. Is it really? How odd, I didn't know, I, I mean, I was just kind of focused on the facial hair. Anyway, it's really crowded in there and I can't have you mingling. I mean, who's gonna pay the price of admission if you're out there for all the world to see, okay? Have a great show. I'm not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. Well, okay, who actually says that? Because I, I'm curious, I, I really don't have any kind of like a backstory for you. I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us. I think I'm just your employer, okay? I mean, do we even have a personal connection? I'm sorry, freaks, I am, but I just don't know any of your names, you know? I mean, over here we have Albino Girl, and uh, Birthmark Boy, and Dog Dude, and uh, oh, Eng and Chang, and uh, uh, oh, the Dreadlocks guy. How are you, a freak again? I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be, this is me. But who are you really? I mean, all I know is that you have a beard and that I hurt your feelings, you know? Wow, millennial whoops, great, that's so great. Hey, listen, I have a Swedish nightingale in here with my name on her, so I'm probably just gonna go right back to the party, okay? Ah, uh, fine, we'll find you in the third act when we've inexplicably forgiven you. Great! you that'll never be enough. Yeah! The Greatest Showman is not very good. The story is full of plot holes, the characters are as flimsy as paper, and the historical whitewashing is borderline offensive. But I get it. I know how valuable a musical like this can be to someone in their formative years. I see teens and young adults becoming obsessed buying the soundtrack, going to live sing-alongs, learning all the choreography, devouring every behind-the-scenes tidbit. And boy, do I remember that feeling. <laughs> when I was in middle school, it was Les Mis. In high school, it was Rent. And in college, Moulin Rouge. But as I continued my musical theater education, something happened. I grew up. I realized that Eponine was just whiny and not at all proactive, that the kids in Rent were just spoiled brats who needed jobs, and that Christian and Satine could have solved all their problems if they just talked to each other. But more importantly, I learned that I wanted more from my musicals than just pretty melodies and hollow messages. I wanted to be challenged, but I wouldn't have gotten there if it weren't for those starter musicals along the way, so... So, if the greatest showman is your Moulin Rouge, Gerald, <laughs> that's okay with me. So tell me, do you want to go? Watch a movie that's all covered with lights. Catchy melodies in your head all night. Imitatable dance moves, millennial whoops. Oh, this, this is, is the okay show. These fan kids won't put it down. The reviews won't stop them now. Keala Michelle here. Zach and Zendaya too Oh, this, this is the OK Show Thanks for watching our review of The Greatest Showman Be sure to subscribe and check back for a new analysis of the best and worst movie and TV musicals Yeah, and if you like what you see um, why don't you subscribe and leave us a comment below Tell us what movie musicals you'd like for us to review <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Hey, um, maybe we were the douchebags all along uh, whatever. The dubbing on Tom Thumb was really jarring. Also, why is Barnum's daughter on point when she hasn't had a single battle? Whatever, old lady. Let's party like it's 2003. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is the okay show! This 
Jesus be okay, sure.